So today uh, it's uh, more, let's say, well, mixed science and try to present some technology. It's not about selling products. Uh, in my case, it's just to give you some overview of a new approach to address the problems of in vivo uh, gene silencing. Uh, that's a completely different story than in vitro. All, all you guys are doing uh, in vitro gene silencing with a siren. I think it's uh, not an issue. But as soon as you go in animals, as soon as you have to uh, deal with serum, with biological materials that are RNAs rich, that will degrade your RNA, as soon as you are thinking about toxicity, side effects, uh, about also injecting animals three, four, five times a week, uh, very cumbersome and resource intensive aspects, you have to think about different technologies. You cannot use the same as RNA you have using in vitro or the microRNA you're using in vitro and then go in vivo, you can do it, but it will imply uh, additional work, additional uh, problems. Uh, and that's what, what we, we thought about, thought about designing a, a complete solution, allowing you to do, go directly from in vitro to in vivo and here with a new technology that's uh, the siRNA of Rybox. So the agenda will be first to just go very briefly about the prerequisites on RNA interference in vivo, RNA interference in the broad sense, so it could be microRNA or siRNA. Then to uh, give you the rational of this uh, from in vitro to in vivo, why we, we thought about uh, doing this, uh, what were the, the questions we were addressing. Then a proof of technology of the, this uh, Ibn and Ivory as RNA. So Ibn and Ivory, there is this song from Paul McCartney and Steve Wonder, Ibn and Ivory, they live in perfect harmony. So it's ebony in this case, it's not ebony. So uh, the perfect harmony is actually to use this in vitro and then to go in vivo and both are harmonized so you can use them in both, both uh, contexts. Then a proof of concept will be shown using a, an in vivo model of uh, infection with the rhinovirus and then dealing with this infection using siRNA, in this case uh, from ebony to ivory and then the conclusion. Very brief overview, where are we now or today with uh, RNA interference used in vivo? This was here uh, designed for siRNA. So you have different, uh, let's say, two big issues. The, the first one is, do you want to deliver your siRNA directly to the tissue, direct RNA interference, or do it intravenously, intraperitoneally, so systemic RNAi? And you see that already the, the, the problems start here. You have really to think about delivering your double-stranded RNA or single-stranded uh, oligonucleotide. The problem of delivering it not only to the cell, but you have to go really upstream and think about delivering it to the first to go through the barriers that are closed, your skin, the eye, the lung, the intestine. It's really the endothelial or closed barriers. If you don't have an injury, like virus infections or inflammation, you won't be able to go through. Second point, you have to go through the matrix of the tissue. Then you have to go through the membrane of the cell. And if you, are go if you have reached the membrane, if you have passed through the membrane of the cell, you have to go to the compartment where in the risk complex will be able then to release your uh, siRNA and then direct it to the messenger RNA. So you have really, really different barriers. And uh, the first one is, of course, directly to the tissue or systemically. And uh, the fields of application are, of course, infections, degenerescence, cancer, and uh, different uh, aspects. So what we think that the prerequisite of in vivo RNA experiments are is R3 by, by itself, first, as I said, the target. We did it in vitro as to specificity and accessibility within the cell. Second aspect, the delivery, of course, the delivery of the sRNA to the organism, the tissue, the cell compartment, and finally to the risk. And very important is the sRNA by itself. It has to be stable in serum and body fluids. It has to have a long-lasting gene silencing in order to decrease the number of applications and the costs and the, the, the burden of a foreign substance to the body. It has to be potent, of course, because of the aspect of toxicity. So there, there is a concept that is really uh, established in, in drug design. It's uh, the selectivity. It's the ratio between the, toxi the, the, the toxicity and the efficiency. So, the lower your EC50 is, that's the efficiency concentration that in 50% of your units, experimental units will give an effect. The lower it is, so it's a low nanomolar uh, region, the higher the selectivity will be for the same toxicity. So you have interest to have a very low EC50, a very low concentration that works, and then you are more selective. 
So to the rational, uh, how we thought uh, to, to go through to address this, uh, this in vitro from in vitro to in vivo. As to the target, our idea was to use a straightforward gene silencing strategy using the same siRNA from in vitro to in vivo. Because as you know, as soon as you're going in vivo, you have to uh, go on and do chemical modification, add 2 prime O methyl to increase the stability of the double strand, else they will be degraded in the serum within minutes. Uh, you have to look at the, the, the problem of, of getting, it, getting them as to the analytic perfectly annealed, really straightforward, uh, uh, double-stranded, they don't anneal differently. And so the point is that you start in vivo with sRNA, you want to go in, in, you go in vitro, you want to go in vivo, you start with modifying 2 prime methyl 2 prime fluor and then going back again to in vitro and testing your molecules, and they could behave completely differently. So we say, okay, we just go in one straight. Second point, of course, is delivery. There, you, we know today that uh, delivery to, uh, of, of oligonucleotides of siRNA is really tissue-specific. Each oligonucleotide, each double-strand RNA, each microRNA, each whatever you, you, you are using to, as a drug is really a, a, a unique entity by itself. Companies developing RNAi as therapeutics today are, they are saying clearly you have really to go all the way, all the steps that you, have, you are going for drug uh, discovery for each oligo. Each oligo is a different entity than the other one. You change one, two nucleotides in your sequence, it's a completely different story. As to distribution, as to concentration in the tissue, as to toxicity, as to off-target effects. So cells and tissue-specific delivery strategies has to be thought about and, of course, the SRNA by itself, and this is where Ibn and Ivory comes with, with this technology. So the rationale was for Ibn and Ivory as RNA to increase stability of this RNA. So in order to need less of the RNA per experiment, you stabilize it, it won't be degraded, and you will have a long-lasting silencing. Uh, we thought about reaching two weeks, two weeks per uh, siRNA gene silencing. The second point is to increase the potency. So less amount of siRNA is needed per experiment. In this case, you will, of course, decrease the costs, but you will lower the, bur the burden of the substance on the, to the animals and to the human body if you are going in phase one, phase two uh, uh, aspect. And then because of the less amount of siRNA, you are having less of target effect and less, to less toxicity. So it was like addressing these problems that uh, Thought, out, thought that we should then engineer a new type of siRNA. And this is the Ibn and Ivory siRNA. So basically it's about enhancing the thermodynamic disequilibrium of the duplex. In this vein, the guide strand will be loaded on the risk. Much more of the guide strand will be loaded on the risk in comparison to the passenger strand. This is one, one, one point. The next point is because of the Modifi modification of the siRNA, there will be less excess of exonucleases to the duplex, so they won't be degraded. And because of a very good stacking of the double strand, they won't be also uh, attacked by, by RNAs that have endonuclease activity. And how we did it? We did it really simply by adding at the opposite of the seed sequence, a GC sequence, a so-called Rybox sequence motif. And this is how it looks like. So. You all know the classical siRNA with 3' overhang. According to Tuchel design, you have your guide strand, your passenger strand, the overhangs here. You have also blunt-ended siRNA that can be used. And the Rybox siRNA, both Ibony and Ivory siRNAs look this way. So these are blunt-ended siRNAs where we systematically put this GC stretch at the opposite side of the seed region so you have a 5 C's on the guide strand and complementary a 5 G's, 5 prime, 3 prime on the passenger strand. This way, you have a much higher stability here with three hydrogen bonds with each G to GC than here. So it's completely independent on the algorithm as to thermodynamic disequilibrium. Of course, the algorithm is important, as we discussed yesterday, for off-target effects and microRNA uh, uh, mimicries. But through this systematic bias that we induce, we have a, an opening of the duplex by the risk complex that occurs here. And through this orientation in the opening of the duplex, there is automatically, and this has been shown in the literature, this is the basis of all the algorithms that you use, that our, all companies are using. You have a, automatically a much, much higher loading of the guide strand on the risk 
in comparison to the passenger strength. So at the end, the active strength, the guide strength, will be much more present in the risk. And so you will need much less of the siRNA to have the same effect. This was a working hypothesis. And I will show you some, some data on, that proves that this technology is really working this way. This is an experiment that uh, a, a group, an independent group did. It was about uh, silencing uh, of uh, IK512, a precursor of insulin in min-6 cells, in celinoma cells, with Ibony siRNA. So you have the controls of siRNA. We are silencing IK512 and its precursor. Scrambled, so negative control. This was Darmacon as transfection reagent. It was alone, so you have here the proteins in Western blood cell control. So you have two siRNAs from a, uh, another, uh, well, let's say with the classical T is for Tuchel, the Tuchel design with overhangs. You have a good silencing. You can see it here. Now you take the same sequence, you chop up the ends, you add the Rybox motif, and you drop with the silencing. You have a much higher silencing that occurs here. Showing really here that everything stays the same, the same concentration, just adding the motif, it changes. This was an experiment done on, in the case of diabetes. This was done in myopaca 2 cells, pancreas carcinoma cells. Silencing was caveolin. Controls are luciferase as ironase. The amounts of proteins are loaded onto gel. So you have a good silencing with caveolin as RNA. Classical design, independent from the company who does it. Just take it, chop the two overhangs, add the Rybox design. You have a stronger silencing, it disappeared. The next point was, this is one point as to in vitro potency that uh, some, some independent groups did, but this, this is really observed by a lot of scientists. Uh, we are selling our products now, not only in Italy, but uh, of course in Germany, uh, in Spain, in, in, in Austria, in Japan, in Taiwan. So it's really now about 150 groups using them since two years, and it's uh, really working beautifully. The next point was for us to ask ourselves, are, those, are, these, are these siRNAs, the Ibony siRNAs, is it more stable in that sense that if you have a better stacking at the end, you will have a higher melting point that is needed to open, actually, the duplex. That's what we did. We incubated the three different siRNAs as to their design. So the sequence is the same, but the design is different. Blunt, overhangs with GC tag. Where's the cyber green? experiments, classical one, heated the duplex and looked at the signal in, in, in the reader. And you see that with a blunt siRNA, you have the melting point at 55 degrees. siRNA with three frame overhangs, you go up to 62. And with the Ibony siRNA, you are coming up to 71. So you have really about 16 degrees difference between blunt and siRNA and the Ibony siRNA when you're adding the GC clamp. But that's what actually we're expecting, higher stability. Now, this correlates back to the stability in serum. Because here we'll expect that if it's much more stable, it won't be degraded by exonucleases. And that's what we saw here. This is an experiment with FCS, fetal calf serum, 80%. We have this, done the same with human serum and, and mouse serum. Here you can see also that the CRI behave differently as to RNAs, as, uh, as digestion of the duplex, because there are different RNAs, different uh, uh, concentration amounts of these enzymes. But this is an example for FCS because we are with Ibony, we are using in vitro. We're doing it in vitro. So if you're using in vitro in your uh, cell culture and you're, you need to supplement with FCS, that's an example here that's interesting for you. So experiment was Ibony siRNA vs siRNA with three prime overhangs. In this case, it incubated three micromolar of the siRNA, 37 degrees in FCS, 80%, and looked at the stability of the duplex over time. And you can see that down to 72 hours, no degradation. This is a native polyacrylamide gel, 20%. If you take the siRNA with overhangs, without the Rybox motive, you are degraded at four hours. Something or six hours is completely gone. So it's something that you're expecting, actually. Same story happens if you're injecting your uh, siRNA or your double stranded RNA in the body. It will be degraded very rapidly, and that's why you can increase then the stability by adding modification, chemical modification or or uh, additional uh, groups to, to protect the siRNA. But this is not necessary for Ibony siRNA, and the same is for ivories. They have the same design because of the GC tag. Now, we have looked also at the silencing. How long do we get a silencing? 
experiment here was just to infect HeLa cells, transfect HeLa cells with uh, uh, Ibanez RNA targeting FDH and look uh, down to 12 days at the silencing that occurs in the cells. This is a controlled housekeeping gene. GAPDH has, this is H -S -H -H HSP90. This is uh, GAPDH is being, being targeted. You have mock cells with riboxfect, transfection agent alone, unspecific siRNA, and the siRNA is targeting it. You can see that down to 12 days, you have a silencing that remains in the, in the cells, and these are the protein amounts that are, that are clearly showing that we have the same amount of proteins on the cells. This is not only in our hands. There are two groups that have observed the same thing in urinal cells and primary cells that were where they were interested in a readout that occurs at 14 days and they saw the same thing. And this is because of the stability, we think, of this iron, but probably also because of the potency. Of course, we asked ourselves, do we have a really cleavage uh, of the messenger RNA? So we did a race experiment, classical race experiment, because the question was, well, what happens with these, with this GC that we add artificially? Are they going, uh, are they really having a, doing a silencing? Uh, do we have a dicer effect? I'll show you some data on this. So this is really a proof of, of technology showing clearly that uh, we have really found, again, the seed region uh, in the, this is a, the race primer, and here we have the seed region that we really found where the cleavage has occurred at position 10 in the messenger RNA. So the gap to H messenger RNA cleaved at position 10 according to the, to the anti-sense seed region. Clearly a very nice cleavage. As I said, question was, is the Ibanez RNA a substrate for dicer? Because we said, okay, there is this, so there are 25 nucleotide in length. So as to the length, it couldn't be a substrate for dicer because, you know, well, there are different sources, different publications. But I think a consensus say, well, starting 28, 29, you will be going the dicer. I don't know what your experience is. And then 32, you are surely in the dicer. So some guys have data on 21 and 25. But I think about starting based on the crystal structure of the dicer, we know that starting 26 nucleotides, I mean, really from a, let's say, a geometrical aspect, really measuring the, the, the active site of the dicer, you, have, you need 26 nucleotides. So we are at 24, 19 plus 5. 5 is the tag. Anyhow, we wanted to have some experimental data and to show if uh, we could have a dicing in vitro by incubating a recombinant human dicer at 37 degrees for two hours with one of these three. So we have three different constructs. Uh, this is the classical one, Ibanez RNA3. These here were chosen because they have a fluoro 4 at the, at the passenger strand at five prime. The passenger strand is located that we uh, put here preferentially if you want to follow on uh, on transfection control, if you're getting in the cells or not, if you also want to go in vivo to see how your RNA is, is going, if you have in vivo imaging. So these are where experiments we did for that kind of molecules, two different siRNAs with a, a fluorophore or without any fluorophore, incubated it with dicer, human dicer, recombinant human dicer, 37 degrees for two hours, and looked on a polyacrylamide gel, 20% if we have a digestion. And you can see that Ibanez RNA alone, no of course, as a control, then with dicer, no digestion. The second one, control, dicer, no digestion, so control, no digestion. So it's really not diced, at least uh, uh, in vitro, in like analytical conditions. Okay, so this was as to the proof of technology. Now, of course, um, our concept is from in vitro to in vivo, to, to go one way through. You start your, design your in vitro experiments, validate your target in vitro, take the same siRNA, go in vivo. So the experimental model was a human rhinovirus. Why did we choose it? For two reasons. The first one is that I'm a virologist from uh, education, and uh, we know this virus very well. So um, first aspect. Second aspect, it has a single-strand RNA genome. So it's like a messenger RNA. You can really use it, as a, use it as a surrogate for your experiments in that sense that you can really also calibrate the amount of messenger RNA you're getting into your cell. You're doing 10,000 variants, you have 10,000 viral genomes. You're doing 1 million variants, you're doing 1 million viral genomes. So, uh, so you can really calibrate the amount of target of your siRNA that you can use. And third, because if you go in vivo in a model of uh, rhinovirus infection, you're using siRNA locally. And so we had, to, we had solved, in that sense, the big problem of delivery. 
it was like infecting the mice, I'll show you some data on this, intranasally and then putting this iron intranasally so you don't have the intravenously problem if you do it this way, will it come to the lung? So those are three reasons and uh, we used it as a, as a model. Now the, the point is that the P coronavirus, so the, the rhinovirus belongs to the enterovirus uh, gen genera, single strand genome, non-enveloped, so it has no, no, it has a capsid but no glycoproteins on the surface and very, very broad serotypes. This is a genome, single strand RNA, fully a tail, cap like structure at the beginning. The genome is then translated like a messenger RNA and then you have a notocatalytic processing of a polyprotein that gives rise to the different viral proteins. So the main story is really that you have really a messenger RNA-like structure that you can use as surrogate. How does the virus replicate? It's important to understand how the sRNA will then work. So you have a, the virus uh, binds to an ICAM-like structure at the, on the surface of the, of the cell, then is there is an uncoating, the viral genome is then translated in this polyprotein that is then processed by viral protease. You have the structural proteins here that come out of it. And par in parallel, in me membrane vesicles, you have the replication of the single-stranded genome in positive strand genome, in negative strand genome, and so on and so forth. At one point, you have encapsidation of uh, the viral genome in the viral capsid and uh, then uh, egress of the virus out of the cell. So clearly the targets of siRNAs are here and there. Now, the experimental model in vitro first was to infect killer cells with the human rhinovirus, design 20 siRNAs targeting the whole viral genome, and these siRNAs were harboring the ribox sequence motif, in this case the Ibony siRNA, and in comparison the overhang. So they are really the same target siRNAs. For the same target you have ribox, Ibony siRNA, and the overhangs. And then you compare with same transfection conditions, same concentrations, the efficiency of silencing of the viral genome, of the viral expression of, of the expression of the viral genome. We did also a phenotypic assay in this case, in addition to the Western blot, where we uh, looked at, uh, through cell proliferation, we could measure the efficient concentration needed to inhibit the viral replication. So the cell proliferation assay basically looked at proliferations of the cells after infection. Your siRNA is targeting the virus. If you kill the virus replication, the cells will proliferate. If you don't hit the virus replication, the cells will die. So in this case, you are not targeting a viral, you're not targeting a gene in the cell. You're targeting with the siRNA the viral genome. You're inhibiting replication of the viral genome, and you're measuring the proliferation of the cell. Efficient siRNA, proliferation. Non-efficient siRNA, cells will die because the virus will kill them. We did also some gene silencing uh, with, uh, we, we, also, we did also Western blood for selected siRNAs, but the first readout was Cell proliferation phenotypic assay measured EC50, the concentration that allows you in 50% of your vials to have an effect. And the cytotoxic concentration, the concentration that allows you in 50% of your vials to have a cytotoxicity of the siRNA by itself. So the siRNA, as I said, encompasses the whole genome, the scheme of the whole genome. Importantly, the beginning of the genome is very highly structured, as it's an iris and it's a very highly structured RNA, and the end of the genome, similarly. So we would expect, actually, that we, in this position and with this position, we couldn't have any good siRNA effect because of the accessibility of the siRNA and the risk to this very strong, strongly structured RNA. Okay, how did the experiments went? So Ibony was synthesized, purified, analyzed. It was given to the cells. And four hours later, the human rhinovirus at 10 to the fourth TCID50 was, was, was applied, and we measured EC50 and CC50. So these are the results of the EC50 in nanomolar, and comparing, comparing the classical design with the Ibony design all over the genome. So first information, of course, as I said, very highly structured region in the genome you don't have any effect whether it's a classical siRNA or the Ibony siRNA because you're not accessing your target. But if you're accessing your target, for example, here at 100 nanomolar, 
You take the same sequence, the same algorithm, everything similar, you add the Rybox design, you just drop down to 3540. This one, 100, uh, almost 150, you drop down. This one too, this is more, much more important, and so on and so forth. So you can really see the, sometimes it's really very, very different, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, more, it's a little more different, but really the, 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 the trend is clear, is clear here. You have an effect, you add your Rybox design, you will have an increased efficiency. Meaning that, in another sense, you will need much less of the SI RNA to have the same effect. If you need 120, you have the same effect with 35. Less SI RNA, less toxicity. If you go in vivo, because we're always thinking ebony and ivory, so we're thinking about in vivo, we have a we have reduction in costs and reduction in, in application times. This is the Western blots data of selected five SI RNAs with 20 nanomolar classical ones. As I said here, we are looking at silencing as a viral protein one. So there is no expression of the viral genome leading to expression of the viral protein. No effect with this five sRNAs at 20 nanomolar. You take the sequence, you add the Rybox design, you have a complete silencing, completely gone. Because you have much more increase of the active active uh, strand, the guide strand on your, on your, on your risk. Now, I go looking at the selectivity, as I said, selectivity is an important aspect. If you go in vivo, you're thinking about toxicity. I mean, like, less siRNA being less toxic to the, for the same effect. If you measure selectivity of these substances, the ratio between CC50 and EC50, if you lower the EC50, you are more selective. And you can see that you have really very high selectivity in Ibony 250 in comparison to the classical ones of 15, so it's about 15 times more selective, meaning that you need 15, you can add 15 times more as RNA until you're toxic or 15 times less to have the same effect. Uh, this one, Ibony 10, the same story, uh, here too, here 274, 30 is about five times. Okay, so we've chosen this as RNA, so Ibony as RNA, to go for further experiments uh, in order not to have a very, let's say, very, uh, you know, that kind of result, it's nice to, 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 to see, but as scientists, you're a little bit cautious. You know, well, this could be an artifact. Or, so we tried to, tried to look something that is really more moderate in difference and took this Ibanez RNA and then went with it in vivo. The same as RNA, nothing has changed. So the proof of concept here was to use the rhinovirus infection then, really in, in organism, in, in small animals. And here you see why. Why? Because the rhinovirus infects the, the nasopharynx, the nose, goes down to the lungs through the airways, and then actually hits the lung. Hits the lung where you have an a, a vir antiviral response, and then after, well, you know, a common cold, so rhinovirus causes a common cold, after so one week to 10 days, you have really cleared the virus out of the body. It's classical RNA virus like flu, like norovirus, the after immune response, efficient immune response, you clear the virus normally out of the body after 10 days. And then you have no inflammation. But we know also that the rhinovirus goes into the lung because it is also uh, well known that infection with rhinovirus, common cold infections, can cause by patients that have a deficient uh, antiviral response or a, a let's say, a, um, a background of uh, allergy or, or, of, or of autoimmunity and inflammation, you can have uh, asthma that can occurs through this infection. So it's really a nice model to, to use uh, in order to validate a technology uh, because you will then infect the mice intranasally and you will look in the lung for the viral load. You can add siRNA intranasally that will go and that will, you will look again at the viral load after adding siRNA or before adding siRNA. So first, uh, the first aspect for us was to validate the infection of the mice with the rhinovirus. What we did, we used different concentration of the virus, 10 to the fourth, 200,000, 1 million TCID50, infected the mice intranasally and looked at the viral load in the lung, in the lower left lobe, after sacrificing the animals, extracting RNA, viral RNA, and looking at the viral load. And you can see the kinetics. It's time post infection, seven days. And you have the viral load. So in red, you have the lower concentration, 10 to the fourth. Viral load increases. 
up to eight hours, then you have a clearance at two days of the virus out of the lung. You increase the concentration, 200,000, you have a clearance that occurs at five days, and if you raise one million, you have a plateau of the viral infection that is then cleared after seven days. So this is a classical infection of, uh, that you can see also in humans. And then we used for our first experiments the 10 to the 6 uh, infection in order to really to, to see a, a uh, black and white uh, response with the siRNA. And see if we working hypothesis was we use siRNA, we have a faster clearance of the virus from the lung as if we don't use siRNA because using siRNA you will hit the viral, the virus, the virus genome won't express the proteins, it won't replicate and it will be cleared much rapidly. So what we did is uh, first in a uh, prophylactic uh, assay, synthesized then the ivory siRNA, so it was ibony 10 that became ivory 10, straight, no change, purify it, analyzed it, applied it in one milligram per kilogram, so the mice were 18 to 20 gram in, in, uh, in weight, uh, they were six week old uh, female BELP6 mice. We'd used liposome based delivery, because it was intranasally, so we didn't need big delivery vehicles. Infected the mice, G excuse me, gave the siRNA, and four hours later, used, infected the mice with, uh, with one million viral particles and looked at the viral load. So this was one assay. The other one was to infect and then in a therapeutic assay to treat the mice after four hours or 24 hours. So I will show you first the results of the prophylactic assay, first as RNAs and four hours later the, uh, the virus. So in red you can recognize here the virus by itself having a kinetics that is cleared after seven days. In gray, it's a negative control, so it's an ivory siRNA, but that is not targeting the viral genome, like a scrambled siRNA. In this case, it was a, an siRNA targeting another virus, the feline Kalitsi virus, but not, target, not having any authority effects. We do not have a clearance. And then you have two, uh, two, two lines. The first line is uh, the ivory siRNA with 125 micromolar, given first and then the virus, and you have a decrease in the viral load that is occurring at 96 hours. And then we thought, okay, let's increase the concentration and see if we have a faster clearance, and we couldn't see any faster clearance with the higher concentration, indicating that with this concentration, it's 125 micromolar, it's one milligram per kilogram, we are efficient enough to, uh, to, 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 to have this uh, clearance of the virus in a prophylactic assay. In a therapeutic assay, it was different. We first infected the mice and then treated. Here the working hypothesis was, it's the same uh, than, uh, than the hypothesis that when you're using, for example, treatment of influenza infections, the sooner you treat, the better it is because you will stop viral replication earlier, and if you stop viral replication earlier, the earlier you stop it, the less it will spread to the tissue, and you will have a faster clearance. You can see here that using uh, ivory siRNA in a therapeutic assay at uh, one milligram per kilogram, 125 micromolar, at four hours, you have a clearance of the virus that's about after two days. And if you use it after 24 hours, you have also a clearance, but it's much later as expected in comparison to the control. So in this case, really, you have seen that we are really already going through from a an in vitro setup, designing the targets, and straightforward down to an, a, an animal model of, of infection and uh, having really a straightforward approach with these molecules. So I would like to sum up, and I think I will be then finished. So uh, in this, for this technology, Ivan and Ivory as RNA, it was about really looking at the prerequisite of in vivo as to as RNA by itself. One point was to address stability in serum body fluid, and this is the case. Ivory and ivory are stable. The long-lasting gene silencing is present in order to address issues of toxicity and application. Many applications to the mice are not good, so you are just reducing this. Potency, I've shown you data, not only our data, but data from other groups, 
that is really an increased potency and we could really measure it up to five-fold in our case. Toxicity is an aspect. Because we are much more selective, we, can, we have a decrease in toxicity up to 15-fold because of the increase of selectivity. As I said, you need much less of this RNA to have this aspect. So a proof of concept from this in vitro to in vivo has been also brought through inhibition of the human rhinovirus infection with Ibania and Ivory siRNA. So I uh, just want to thank the people, of course, who did this work. This is uh, the guys working in the company. You see you are fast, uh, except myself, as young as yourself. So uh, it's, uh, it's our scientific uh, staff here, production director, R&D research director here. It's a small company. We are 17 uh, people. Uh, this is our animal facility, our production and, and R&D facility here, the administrative uh, uh, building located in Dresden. Uh, Red Boyle is a small, uh, small village uh, uh, near, near Dresden. Uh, so thanks a lot for your attention, and I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you.